Um, back in 2006, uh, I gave a presentation in uh, Chicago at a 9-11 Truth Conference. And um, obviously being in Chicago and uh, being in the States, I tried to present elements of 9-11 that weren't necessarily known to the, uh, well, not just the general public, but even known at that time amongst the community, the rapidly growing community. There were 600 people there, by the way, the 9-11 Truth Conference. <laughs> The, the, the video of my presentation is on YouTube, but you would never recognize me because it was actually six months before I got my hair cut. <laughs> and and after, I, after I finally kissed goodbye to the corporate check, I just sort of decided I was going to grow my hair. It would look pretty stupid now, but <laughs> it was now here. Then. Anyway, but in that presentation, one of the things that I picked up and presented was that the alleged pilot of Flight 77 the flight that supposedly went into the Pentagon, um, you know, the one that flew in at 530 miles an hour at a flight of about two and a half feet <laughs> without leaving a mark on the lawn <laughs> or any wreckage. Um, but anyway, the pilot was a uh, man by the name of Charles Burlingame. Now, coincidentally, Charles Burlingame had actually been the author of a training exercise that had been conducted at the Pentagon the previous year, in fact, almost exactly one year earlier, in October of 2000. And he was the architect of this exercise, it was a, um, a sort of emergency services training exercise, and the exercise was based on a plane crashing into the center of the Pentagon. And this is the guy who was allegedly the pilot of, um, of Flight 77 on that fateful day in 2001. Well, then a couple of years later, three years later, I happened to be uh, obviously doing some work with Edge Media at that time. And one of the guests on On The Edge was Phil McConnell. And I was talking with Phil McConnell and uh, I actually broached this issue in the, in the program about Charles Burlingame. And Phil McConnell says, yeah, I was at flight training school with him. <laughs> so uh, you called him Chuck, I think. Ch uh, Chuck or Chick? Chick. Chick. Chick, Chick Burlingame. And uh, anyway, so I had a, a very interesting uh, conversation with Field, and he helped me start my car that night, if I remember, because... It was a diesel, and it didn't start easily. That's right. And you had to play with something between the seats. Yeah, well, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, so I've seen some of the material that Field's been presenting and writing over, uh, you know, the recent uh, years. Um, and uh, fascinating gentleman with remarkable history, another obviously qualified pilot, military pilot, and then how many years with... Uh, airlines? Yeah. 31. 31. So he's got one or two hours under his belt, so he might just know what he's talking about. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil McConnell. Ian. He's, thank you very much for that kind introduction. You said belt. I've got a belt and a buckle, and here's your belt and buckle, oh, and it's going to be collect. I mean, your belts will come. We don't know your size. We think 28 or 30. Yeah. But, <laughs> but there's your buckle. So thank you for having this great gathering, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Now that I gave him a treat, I can correct him. Chick Burlingame and I went to the Naval Academy for four years. He and I were both Phantom pilots, which is an F-4. The Royal Navy had them. Uh, a bunch of Air Force guys flew around here and made noise and killed birds for you. Uh, they had them. Uh, and the United States of America killed Chick Burlingame, and he did not hit American 77. And if there's anybody in here who doesn't like <laughs> direct speaking and occasionally a colorful word, and let me address this. Up until I was 44, I used a lot of color for words. In, 19, in uh, 1994, when I was 44, God himself said, you can do it the way you're doing it, or you can do it my way. And I, I sensed, I still use those words, because that's what we need. Because the stupid guys killing my friends, they don't speak love, they don't speak equality, they don't speak acceptance, they don't speak the truth. Okay, Chick Burlingame, they killed him. See that guy? George H.W. Bush. Oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to talk about Hillary first. Uh, and uh, my book, and uh, by the way, I wouldn't have written this book, but there's a lady here whose name will remain anonymous for about another three minutes. Um, 
about January of this year, she said, Field, would you write one more book? And I said, no, because I've, and I don't want to sound boastful. There's nothing, there's no ego in what I do. I've been called to do this. I've been prepared to do it. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about the world. It's about the truth. And it's about kicking the ass of the people that have killed my friends. <laughs> and that brings up Hillary, because some asses are bigger than others. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, frankly, I, uh, I've dedicated my recent life and I've dedicated this book uh, to some people. And if I, have, if I were to die in three minutes, the last three minutes, I would say none of this is about me and none of it's done by me. But the dedication in my book, which is, I don't have any here for sale. It's not about money. It's about truth. But my book is dedicated to the 248 soldiers of Arrow Air 1285, these guys, right here, Arrow Air 1285, were killed under the orders of George H.W. Bush. Uh, the 18 soldiers killed at Mogadishu. Uh, Mogadishu soldiers died because of complicity between William Jefferson Clinton and Boutros Boutros Galli, G-H-A-L-I. Uh, you'll notice I name names. And my na if anybody wants to shoot me, come get it. But my name's Field McConnell. It's right there, and I'm not hiding from anybody. Uh, Pat Tillman was killed in Afghanistan by, I came here thinking British SAS people with uh, SA-80 bullpup rifles gave him three 223 rounds through the forehead. I got the rounds right. I got the forehead right. I think I have the rifle right. I think I have the shooters wrong. I think they were from Germany, and I found that information here. So if you think there's no value to the gathering of people, there's one more notch in your belt, Ian. Um, the next thing I, the next group that I've dedicated this, excuse me, this to, are 38 men and a service dog named Bart of Extortion 17, the helicopter that was shot down on the 11th of August, excuse me, the 6th of August of 2011. Uh, and let's just name names and get right after it the five senior people that authorized the murder of 38 men and a dog named Bart. Uh, that You may have heard the name Obama. It's not his name. His name is Barry Swatero. Uh, he went to my high school, Punahou School, Honolulu, Hawaii. He was in the class of 79. I was in the class of 67. His name, when he was registered there, was Barry Swatero, Punahou 79, Indonesian Muslim. Do I hate Muslims? No. Am I afraid of Muslims? No. Did I ever fly in a Muslim airline? Yes. Did any of them ever try to kill me? No. If anybody's going to try to kill me, anybody guess which country that might be? <laughs> yeah, you're right. The, the guys I'm naming. So you got Obama, uh, you got Leon Panetta, Secretary of Defense, uh, you got a four-star general named Martin Dempsey, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time they blew up the helicopter. Uh, and I had the sad duty, I hope I get around to talking about this without crying, but uh, some of the, well, a par parents from the SEAL family, I mean, there were 16 or so SEALs amongst the 38 men, and they sought me out, this couple, and I'll name their name, and they wouldn't mind, Billy and Karen Vaughn, V-A-U-G-H-N. Their son was Aaron Carson Vaughn, uh, SOC, which means Special Operations Chief, USN, which means Navy. And by the way, if you think I'm being pro-military, I am. If you think I'm being pro-America, I'm not. If you think I shouldn't be pro-America, I mean pro-military, militaries should be used for defense. You guys call your phony baloney group the Ministry of Defense. Well, why are you dropping bombs on everybody? <laughs> okay? Over at my phony baloney country, which is simply an extension of your phony baloney country, <laughs> Uh, we call it the Department of Defense. Well, I'd like them all to line up and kiss my derriere. That's French. Because they're not, we're not defending anything. We have no enemies. There are people in this room who hate America. Hey, why? S because your foreign policy. Hey, we're on the same team. I hate the foreign policy, but it's not our foreign policy. It's yours. It's the Crown. It's the Vatican. It could be the Royals. I don't know. But I believe, I think the Royals should be informed of what the government's doing. I don't know that. I'm not a Brit, but I'm marrying a Brit, and we'll talk about her later. Uh, this is, notice I said her. Uh, I, not that I'm thinking about any of your government people, you know, Ted Heath. Uh, 
All servicemen killed by their own leaders. Let me read that one again. It's very important. All servicemen and women killed by their own leaders. That didn't say U.S. It didn't say Western allies. All servicemen of any military branch of any country of any era that have been killed by their leaders, uh, if I could find you, I'd try to settle that. To my parents, Glenn and Eileen McConnell, who set the example for me, and to my Lord and Savior, who protects me. And as I speak, you'll know that I do need some protection, and I've got it, and I've had it for a while, and I've really needed it a lot for 10 years. Because when you go around naming names, like, for instance, 256 dead people, G.H.W. Bush, this guy, his name, it doesn't matter what his name is, it's written there in small print, but it doesn't matter. If this was a black man from Africa, a one-legged woman from India, or a person in a deathbed in Rwanda, I'd be just as energized to defend them and to explain who's killing them. It's the same group that's killing all of us. And I wish they'd start with me, because I frankly, until I met Denise, I didn't want to be around anymore. This is an ugly world we live in. So are we all going to hide? No. no. And does everybody have to do something? Not necessarily. Let me just tell you, the team has been assembled that can right this ship. That's Navy talk, because I went to Annapolis, whoop de doo uh, This guy was a, uh, his name was Colonel James Sabau, USMC, United States Marine Corps. He was a Vietnam-era pilot, and uh, he's one of the, I don't have many notes, because I never, I speak to crowds. In fact, there's a blonde woman, there's a guy that plays guitar, there's a guy with his hands on his lips, there's somebody with something on his shirt. I speak to you, and I speak from here. Amen. Thanks for the amen, by the way. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I get so touched that it's hard to talk, but I'll get through this. I do have a couple of notes here, and most of them aren't important. See me smile? <laughs> I can tell you who's got the power here, and it's not George H.W. Bush. Uh, he doesn't have any power. And uh, somebody wanted me to talk about Hillary Clinton, and I was going to talk about her first, because a gentleman who I just met two days ago said, don't start off on him, start off on her. And I said, why? And he said, ladies first. So, <laughs> and he, but of course, he's flawed thinking. She's no lady. Uh, she really isn't. Oh, and does she know me? Yeah, she does. And I'm going to tell you right now, just because in case somebody dies or gets sick, I want you to hear my punchline before I give you my spiel which has, I have very few notes. I have no points that I want to talk about. I have no books for sale. I have nothing here but the truth and love. Um, thank you. Uh, I have one, two, three, four. I have seven connections to the truth that I think anyone in here, it doesn't matter what your level of education is. It, it matters greatly what your level of understanding and perhaps your hearing is. But I'm going to tell you seven reasons statistical reasons why I shouldn't be here that are beyond my control, and because of these seven things, that's why I'm here, I think. Number one, the F-16s over uh, Washington, D.C. on 9-11. In fact, I'll give you the people like details, and I would encourage no one to take notes. It's all being recorded, and anyone who wants to email me, f-i-e-l-d-m-c-c at yahoo.com. Uh, we've got two websites, but we're not here to promote ourselves. We're here to promote uh, salvation, safety, eternity, health, wealth, and the uh, pursuit of happiness. Okay, I was an F-16 pilot for North Dakota, whoop de doo Before that, I flew F-4s for North Dakota. But in both cases, over my 26-year military career, my military specialty was the interception of unknown flying vehicles. And the authority I had, and believe me, I'm one of those guys that instead of ready aim, fire, it's ready, fire, and please excuse me, I just fired without, yeah, we, if you're working for a entity who's supposed to protect the people, don't let the chain of command slow you down, protect the people, even if it costs you your career, and I've given up several, uh, one of which was the airlines, because when I started telling the truth of the technology of 9-11, uh, my friends and yours at the United States Department of Justice told my company, Northwest, which is now Delta, they said, shut him up or you, Northwest, will get no more route authority. And they tried really hard. Now, you guys have seen me for about seven minutes. Do you think I'm easily shut up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, so what did I do? They, they said, uh, and here's where the colorful language has to be squelched, but uh, w after I started telling the truth about 9-11, simply because of these seven reasons, which I will complete, my employer said, Field, shut up, and my res in writing, four-paragraph letter, I've got all the letters, not with me, but they're available. They said, Field, shut up, and I said, buzz off. Not exactly, but similar. And then they said, uh, no, no, Field, really, shut up. And I said, mm, no, really, buzz off. And they said, uh, we're not kidding. Uh, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. They said, you either shut up or you're not going to like what happens. And I said, well, buzz off. And then they sent me the fourth letter, and I'm going to hold up these notes, not because I need the notes, and the guitar, guitar player will show you that there's nothing written on, the, written on these notes. I get my fourth letter on the uh, 13th of March of 2007, and I open the letter, it's a FedEx letter from Northwest Airlines, and there's four paragraphs that says, Field, we told you to go to a psychiatrist in Los Angeles, and you were supposed to be there on the 1st and 2nd of March of, of this year, 2007, and you didn't go. So we'll give you one more chance. <laughs> you go to the shrink, and I didn't know this at the time, I'm smiling because they're so dumb. Um, <laughs> I didn't know this at the time, but what they were after was my expert witness value. Hmm, they didn't get it, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And it's nothing to boast about. It's just God taking care of me. But it, it said, we're going to give you one more chance. If you'll go out to see Dr. Elliot in Los Angeles, uh, he will interview you and see if you should continue as an airline pilot. And I read that. I got down to that part, and I put the paper down, and I turned to somebody that I once was married to, and I said, would you do me a favor? Would you look at this letter and for once... Would you please just not say anything at all until you're done with the letter and you fully understand it? And I was surprised that, uh, and I'm not being disrespectful, I was surprised this person read the letter and appeared to understand it. She handed it back to me. I thought, gee, this is interesting. But anyway, I said, and the time was 9.20 in the morning on the 13th of March of 2007. And I said, uh, what do you think of that letter? She said, if that was a letter to me, I'd quit right now. And I said, well, there's two differences in our personality. Uh, you want to quit. I want to retire. I said, there's a big difference monetarily. I said, also, you want to quit right now, and I want to retire in 10 minutes. So this is your nine-minute warning. You've got nine minutes left before I pick up the phone and retire. Nine minutes went by. The it just so happened, well, never mind, it doesn't matter what we were watching, but if anybody has an interest later, I don't want to bore everybody. Um, 9.30 in the morning on the 13th of March, the TV show, and I don't watch TV, I don't, I don't read the newspaper, but I was watching something encouraging, and by the way, we all need to be encouraged. It's a very, yeah, yeah, it's a very ugly world we live in, but we have so few uh, perpetrators that it's my mandate, uh, my privilege, my honor, and my purpose to make the perpetrators nervous of me because I'm never going to get nervous of them. But anyway, I picked up the phone at 9.30. I called Northwest Airlines. A woman's name who I never can remember, but, be, you know, I'm upping my game for you, Ian. Her name was Ramona. She answered the phone in the uh, chief pilot's office, and she said, Ramona, and I said, Ramona, are any of the three chief pilots here today? She said, yeah, one of them. And I said, which one? And she said, when I name names, by the way, it's because I want everybody to understand the whole truth. She said, yeah, Tim Butel is here today. And I said, could I please speak to Tim? So a couple minutes later, Tim gets on the phone and says, Tim Butel. And I said, Tim, this is Field McConnell. Uh, have you heard anything interesting regarding my employment? <laughs> And he said, no, I've just heard little bits and pieces, which means, yeah, I know everything that's going on, but I don't want to humiliate you. <laughs> anyway, I said, well, uh, regardless of how much or how little you know, I want you to know that you need to retire me today and get me off the property. He said, oh, no, you know that takes six weeks or 60 days. Uh, and I said, yeah, I know that. I said, that's normal. I said, this is not normal. I said, you need to get me retired today because of what I'm going to do tomorrow. Because Northwest Airlines doesn't want any part of me tomorrow. And he said, uh, okay. Uh, and he said, yeah, well, that's right. And Northwest Airlines is one of the safest airlines in America. Now it's Delta, and they're one of the biggest airlines in the world. But they can't afford this because the, this truth doesn't play well in boardrooms or in stockholder, whatever you call those guys, uh, you know, the, 
the stock thing. But uh, I want to make Delta Airlines safer. It was my intention to make Northwest Airlines safer, but I refused not to, f I, I was just not going to operate airplanes if they wouldn't prove to me that there was no Boeing uninterruptible autopilot on the airplane. And I was being, I'd been selected, and I was about ready to start training on the Boeing 747-400, which was the biggest airplane uh, operated in America then, it still is. Uh, it's the highest paying job in the American airline industry. Uh, it was right up until 9-11. And here's the funny part, and there's always a funny part. When they told me, shut up, or you're going to be done, I turned the tables. 1936, Helen Ward, you turned the tables on me. Anyway, I turned the tables on them, and I said, no, 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 no. I, I retired. They got me retired that day. Uh, then along comes a woman whose name, I'm, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to change her last name to Brown. Uh, a woman named Carol A. Brown called me and said, uh, Field, uh, did you retire yesterday from Northwest? And I said, yes, I did. And I said, who am I speaking to? She said, Carol A. Brown. And I said, oh, okay, what can I do for you? Well, I'm a little confused because I've been here since 1977, and in the last 30 years, you are the only pilot that's ever retired before I knew you were retiring because I handle all the retirements. And I said, well, I hope I didn't get you in trouble. She said, no, but I'm, you've got me really intrigued. How did you retire in one phone call? And I said, this is stuff that's sort of sensitive, so why don't you tell me that I need to come to you and fill out some retirement paperwork? And she says, okay, I will. She says, Field, this is Carol. Who did I say she was, Brown? Yeah, it's not. It's, it starts with a J. It doesn't matter. She'll know who she is. She said, well, my name's Carol A. Brown, this is my extension number, and my email address is Carol A. Brown at nwa.com. I said, okay, I can be there next week. You just email me when you know you have a slot, and I'll come tell you face-to-face. -face. The guitar player right here, I'm going to use him as a prop. I said, I'll come look at you face-to-face, -face and I will tell you exactly how I retired and why. So I did. I went down there. I didn't have to go down there. Um, but she, she really wanted to hear it, and back then I, I, I was never afraid of telling the truth. But I was trying to be respectful to the airline community around the world and around the globe. Uh, and so far, I haven't gotten anybody in trouble. And as you can see, I'm not dead yet. Knock on aluminum. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's my story. But I was talking about some of the reasons I'm here. Uh, my F-16 unit was overhead Washington, and uh, they saw what was going on, and I know what they saw. Uh, just to show I've got some recall, their, flight, their call signs were quit 25, Q-U-I-T, quit 25, quit 26, quit 27. Their names were Brad Derrig, Craig Bjorgstrom, and Dean Ekman. Um, and, you know, they, they experienced something on 9-11. And I'm connected to them simply because I used to fly for that Air National Guard unit, and I used to fly F-16s, whoop de doo who cares, not me. Uh, American 77, that someone in this, I think Ian said something about 77 in Chick Burlingame, it was you. Um, my college classmate uh, at Annapolis, the, you guys have Sandhurst and some other things, we have Annapolis and some other things. Um, uh, he and I were four years at Annapolis, he was a Navy F-4 Phantom pilot with a really good uh, resume. I was an Air National Guard F-4 pilot with a really bad resume, and both of them were based on attitude if you haven't figured it out. But uh, uh, when they drove him, well, they didn't drive him into the Pentagon. Uh, his airplane, American 77, never hit the Pentagon. Okay, everybody's saying, where'd it go? It went to Whiskey 386 Alpha Airspace, 60 miles east of Norfolk, Virginia, and it was detonated with Smack Sonic, which is French, uh, explosives that look, they look and act like sound, vibrational, and thermal insulation. The only problem is, you're a scientist, Ian, I am not. Uh, it's a three, it's a trilaminar, three layers, two white layers and a black layer, and, and uh, it looks like insulation. Uh, the only problem is if you take electromagnetic energy and you introduce a spark, it's, it takes the temperature of the aircraft from ambient, which would be around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, to 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit in less than a second. What that does scientifically is it, it creates a huge overpressure and there's pressure relief valves on airplanes that are supposed to protect against an overpressure. Well, they're not supposed to protect against 5,800. That means nothing to anyone in this room unless you're a scientist, and I'm not. Uh, the heat on the surface of the sun is 11.6. So the heat in American 77 
uh, went to one half the heat of the sun, which creates a huge overpressure and blows the empennage off. What's the empennage? That's a French word for tail. It's got the little wings on the back, and it's got the big thing that goes this way. That's the empennage. And uh, that, that takes us to United in 93, because that one got blown up over uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And see, it doesn't help their fake 9-11 when you have evidence on the ground. That's for another day. Okay, so I've got the F-16 thing. I've got the uh, Chick Burlingame American 77 connection because one, I was in the Air National Guard in that unit. Number two, he and I went to college together. Uh, the BUAP, this is a foot stomper, don't write it down, um, stands for Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot. I addressed that with a young lady who's uh, got split personality, not, no, 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 split, what do you, nationality. Uh, Iranian, Iranian and American. Uh, le as long as we're on uh, dual citizenship, uh, I may become a dual citizen with Denise, my English fiance, and she will certainly become a dual citizenship with me. Um, well, I don't never say never. I mean, I could be dead tomorrow, couldn't I? Yeah, we all could. That's that's the reason I'm trying to encourage you. But anyway, when I started talking about the Boeing interruptible nine, you know, autopilot. Uh, and its relationship to 9-11. First of all, I'm not smart enough to understand this stuff. Uh, I never should have been in receipt of this stuff, but I've been prepared uh, every step of my life along the way. I've been prepared for where I'm at today. Okay, so they made a... I was an F-16 pilot of the only unit that was over D.C. Small statistical probability of my being in control of that. Uh, the guy they zapped because you rightfully said he wrote the war plan, so and he'd recognize the war plan, just sort of like I did because I recognized 9-11. Because I'd given that war plan, I'd given the technology, intellectual technology, I gave it to Hillary Clinton via my sister. Now, am I going to name my sister's name? Yep. Am I going to do it now? Nope. What does that do? It makes you guys listen till I name it, and I will. Uh, my sister took the intellectual property for me, she shared it with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton uh, was then at Rose Law uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, where they made, there was a BEI corporation that made uh, QRS-11 tri triaxial gyroscopes that they put into Raytheon supersonic missiles, and he's about ready to do something. I hope he's not here to kill me. <laughs> Actually, I don't. I don't care. I, get, I could give a rat's ass. Uh, but anyway, uh, Hillary got a hold of this technology. It's called, uh, she was a patent lawyer. She got a hold of the patent of the QRS-11, and then it somehow migrated over to Raytheon, uh, the headquarters of which is somewhere in the East Coast, but they build the missiles in Phoenix, I believe. Um, so that's a connection I have, the Boeing uninterruptible thing. I rec just like Chick Burlingame would have recognized the, war the, the plan for the exercise that went rogue. That's what 9-11 was. It was an exercise, and it went rogue. He, if he were alive then, he would have recognized it, and he would have blown the whistle. Well, I'm still alive. I did recognize it. I did blow the whistle, and I'm not dead yet, but they can come and get it anytime they want. Uh, the next thing uh, that puts me in a unique position is this guy right here, Colonel James Sabo. Uh, and this book right here has been signed. Ian, you're going to sign this, I hope, or I want my belt buckle back. But um, it's been signed by a couple of people. Uh, Michael Shrimpton was the first guy to sign this book. In fact, no, you're the only guy to sign this book, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, several other people have been selected to sign this book, Ian being one, and there's about five people from the organization which doesn't exist called Able, Able Danger, which is on my belt buckle. Which and My belt buckle does exist, but Able Danger doesn't. But the people trying to destroy the world, they think we do. And they can't believe... Uh, well, just let me tell you what they think. They think that we had 10,000 agents three years ago. They're not right. But anyway, we know they're not right or they wouldn't be trying to destroy us all. Back to my lack of script. Um, of all of the pilots in the world, uh, what are the statistical probabilities that you got a guy connected to the F-16s on 9-11, college classmate to American 77 on 9-11, uh, gave the intellectual property to Hillary Clinton for 9-11, uh, was in a recruiting magazine with him in 1974. In fact, I, I'm not going to take the time, but uh, during the workshop tomorrow or later today, if you see me in this book, uh, in here is a picture of me as a young, healthy, skinny guy that believed what my commanders told me occasionally. And then there was this guy who was really, 
I don't use the H-E-R-O word. There's no H-E-R-O's. I would say Dr. Uh, Downing and, I, well, all the speakers, but then the uh, Willem, these guys are much more heroic because they're talking truth to power. And as far as the power goes, I work for the most powerful entity in the world. Some of you don't believe that. That's okay. I still work for him. Uh, and uh, the odds of me being through those four things, and those four things, again, the F-16s, American 77, Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot, this guy, Recruiting Magazine, what are the odds that in... Uh, not in March of 2014, when Malaysia 370 went down, uh, the only pilot from anywhere in the world that I'm aware of that was called to Malaysia to tell them where their airplane was, was me. And I went. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. Um, how did that happen? Well, the day it went down, which was the 8th of March, let me back up. The day it is alleged to have gone down, and it may have, uh, that was the 8th of March. Before, where I live in Wisconsin, before the sun went down that day, um, we had a YouTube out, and I will speak very slowly because some of you might want to go to your room and watch this. It takes six minutes. Boeing uninterruptible autopilot. When you see that, or if you see it, you'll think, boy, the field is really fast. Well, you, if it was me who made it, you'd be right. I didn't make it. Somebody who knows what I talk about, who respects what I do, and he knows I don't, I'm not a glory hog, and I'm not... I'm not going to live forever, so let's let her rip. Uh, he put out a YouTube about my true history. So who would write my true history in a YouTube other than me? I don't have the technological skills to make a YouTube, and Matt knows it because I had to go get help to get this thing put on a stick because I didn't know what a stick was. <laughs> but I do know where to stick things. And uh, so let me stick a few more people here. I went to Malaysia. They called me on March 22nd which was a Saturday, two weeks after the airplane event. Uh, and they said, would you be willing to come here and tell us what you think happened? And I said, yes, today's Saturday, I can leave tomorrow. They said, oh, wait a minute, you moved too fast. And I said, well, you want to know the answers or not? You know, they said, yeah, but we need to get certain people in position. Uh, and the certain people were four members of the government, either then the current administration or the immediate prior administration. Uh, and we need to get together 15 supposed experts from the airline. And they got both groups together. I left Minneapolis on the 15th of April of 2014. I spent four nights down there. I spilled my guts. I told them what happened. But one of the smartest things I've ever done, and it's not because I'm smart. It's just it was an inspiration. After I accepted the invitation to go speak to them, pardon me while I try to keep from coughing, out of nervousness, I assure you. Um, <clears throat> Between when they asked me and I accepted and when I left, which was 15th of April, I put in writing on the 29th of March of 2014, I put in writing, sent to them, and I published it on the Internet. I said, Malaysia, I'm coming down there to explain this to you, and I'm going to give you two technologies, BUAP and ATI, and if you don't make those things public, uh, then you should, I'm going to speak very slowly, then you, Malaysia, and you, Malaysian Airline Systems, if you don't make this public, you should expect to lose another 777 by 1,900 hours on the 17th of July of this year. I wrote that on March 29th. You can confirm this on the internet and see the date of when I wrote that. Anybody in the room, just raise your hand if you know the answer. Don't blurt it out. Does anybody in, I thought so. Uh, July 17th was the day Malaysia 17 was struck. Uh, and I could, I don't have time to explain that. Uh, and there's other people who say, well, how did you know it was going to happen? Uh, maybe I'll explain that at the workshop tomorrow because I didn't know it was going to happen. I was lucky. If you believe in luck, if you believe in divine inspiration, well, <laughs> pardon me? Uh, well, there's something much more powerful than luck, but I've been very lucky. My, well, I'm engaged to a beautiful woman from England. How could you get more lucky at my age? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so two more names that I think are absolutely unworthy of mention, but one's white, one's black, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, and I've got a personal relationship with two, and I want to put them both out of business. Uh, the white guy is uh, sort of a round hothead named John McCain. I, I've, he and I went to the same college together. He's a hawk. Hawk is a singular, it's a one-syllable word for coward. What a hawk wants is some other young guy to go out and get killed for your agenda. Well... 
ladies, plug your ears. Kiss my ass. I'm not dying for you guys. I mean, I would for you, I, but I wouldn't for McCain. So what do I do if I'm not going to die for people like that? I file treason charges. If you Google my name, which doesn't matter, but there it is. My name, John McCain, treason. It'll all come up. Now, somebody will say, well, it must not have worked. Well, actually, it did. Because his running mate, uh, I filed those treason charges on the 6th of... 6th of April of 2008, there was a presidential thing going on, and the short guy with a bad attitude uh, was running for president, and his running mate was Tim Pawlenty, who was the uh, governor of Minnesota at the time, and the laws, the regulations, for those who are foolish enough to follow all of them all the time, is if you want to declare, or if you want to accuse somebody of treason, you have to do one thing. I'm going to go one. You have to tell a governor or a state Attorney General, okay? So remember they say do one? So I did one, two, three, four, because I know how they play these stupid games. If you're, the, if you're the governor of Minnesota, I give it to you, okay, you throw it in the garbage. Sorry, not, I'm not playing that game. So I sent it to the governor of Minnesota, the governor of North Dakota, the chief justice of North Dakota, the chief justice of Minnesota, and I said, my name's Field McConnell, Naval Academy 71, and I accuse John McCain, Naval Academy of 58, of treason, which runs in his family. Anybody heard of the USS Liberty? Liberty. Yeah, his father did that. Uh, his grandfather and his father were admirals in World War II, and they're, uh, they've been accused of treasonous acts, and I'm comfortable in my heart they're guilty. So I think I pretty well just disparaged his uh, reputation. By the way, he's running for election, and he's come out and said, re-election, excuse me, he said, if Donald Trump gets elected, my ass is grass. Well, let's not wait for Trump. Let me turn it to grass for you. Uh, <laughs> Then the, here's the, the, I've got the white short guy, now let's get the black tall guy, uh, Obama. Well, first of all, his name is not Obama. And I would never be foolish enough to name the name Obama and try to get back into the U.S. day after tomorrow. So let me change, you must have misrecorded something. What I said clearly was Barry Swatero, Punahou 79. When he graduated from my high school, he was listed as an Indonesian Muslim. When he went to college, Occidental College in L.A., uh, he was a Fulbright Scholar. No more questions, we have no more time. But a Fulbright scholar, just like a Rhodes scholar, these are guys that have to be foreign students. Well, he couldn't have had a Fulbright scholarship if he wasn't a foreign student, and he was. He was an Indonesian. Oh, okay, well, then what happened? Then he went to another college somewhere, and he was a foreign student. That was Columbia, where, strangely enough, none, none of the other college kids ever saw him. Do you ever see him? Nope, never saw him. Okay, part of the reason they didn't see him is over in Pakistan on an Indonesian uh, passport, under the name Barry Spatero, and he was working with a guy who, if I said Tim Osman, you wouldn't recognize it, I hope. Uh, you might recognize the name Bin Laden. Yeah, and so he was in Pakistan, Quetta, Q-E-T-T-A, and he was uh, working with Bin Laden, and his mother, mommy, his mommy was over there with him, and uh, not, excuse me, his m grandmother, I think. We'll check that out. Um, but anyway, he was over there working as a CIA agent, allegedly. Uh, and, and you can't be a U.S. citizen in Pakistan, not in 1981. You can't use a U.S. passport to get there. So if he were standing right here, first thing I'd do is I'd take the heel of my boot and I'd stick it on the ball of his foot. And then when he tipped over, I'd probably be unkind also. But uh, he, he, he's really confused about who he is. When he went to my high school, he was Barry Sotero. When he went to Pakistan, he was Barry Sotero. When he got uh, elected in Illinois first, by the way, just to settle the score, I know where I'm at, and I can't pronounce Bletchley Park, but it's just right around here, and I participated in the reopening of the Gareth Williams deal because I had a hard time believing he could get himself in a North Face hold all and then zip it shut and put a lock on it. I just, I'm not... Maybe it's me, but I, I didn't think that was right, so I put out a letter to the FBI, and suddenly they reopened his deal, and suddenly the MI6 people invited the FBI. They said, why don't you come over and help us solve this? I think what they meant was, why don't you come over here and help us figure out how to shut that guy up? But it doesn't matter. He was killed just the same as that guy and uh, Chick Burlingame. All the passengers on United 77, 93, when 93 was United, American 77, American 11, United 93, United 175. 
I've also, before I wrote this book, I used to write on the internet, <clears throat> and I don't recommend you go looking for that. It's rather colorful on purpose. But um, I am going to write 12 more books in this series, and they're all, right, they're all called Shake Hands with the Devil. And what that means as an airplane, t when are you going to give me the five-minute warning? Oh, well, yeah, you, better give it, you better give it when it's due, or I'll... Okay, well, the, the point of this, um, I was very proud of Willem, I think, or Ian, or Dr. Downing. One of those three men said evil. Well, if you cover up the D, what do you get? You get evil. Most people in this room, or let me rephrase that, many people in this room don't believe evil exists. I'm here to tell you it does. I'm not making you nervous. I can tell you that the people that are going to engage evil uh, have been assembled and we're better at our jobs than they are at theirs. That's why I freely stand before you and say Obama, McCain, Hillary Clinton, David Cameron, Tony Belier. Is it, is it Belier? Yeah. I, I can never remember the names of the swine ministers. But all of these people that think they're powerful, well, I work for uh, a power that's much greater than them. They come and go. Where's Ted Heath? I don't know. He might have fell off the morning cloud again. Uh, I think that was the 2nd of September of 74 when the, one of the boats got destroyed in a storm. Uh, on, well, never mind, that was unkind. But, uh, and he was unkind, too, to a series of... He had a rotating merry-go-round of little boys. Uh, that doesn't float with people, whether they're Muslims, uh, Hindus, Buddhist, agnostic, atheist. Unless someone is a pedophile... Pedophilia doesn't float, and I've been around the world, and I've talked to everybody, and nobody likes it except the guys and the gals that do it. And our governments, UK and US, uh, the common thing that gets all of these things that I would call evil, the common denominator is pedophilia. Does that mean every single person is involved in pedophilia? No, but if you're not involved, you better shut up or you'll be dead. Okay, well, come get me. I mean, I'm done speaking soon. You. Can, they can shoot me right after it, but until then, I'm not going to be dead. Uh, Maddie McCann, Holly Grigg, doesn't matter what all the details are. I'm not English. I'm not Scottish. I hate pedophilia because I have four daughters and one son, and if anybody did that to my four daughters or my one son, they wouldn't need to think about a birthday present because, frankly, these people that do this are animals, and sadly, the animals run your country and mine. Uh, so... Now how much time do I have? I don't want to overstep. Oh, great. Then let me talk. I don't have much here on my notes. It's important. But uh, several things that I've heard that greatly encourage me. He said, I think it was you, that said spiritual. Um, he talked on the opening night, he talked about five or six adjectives, one of which was spiritual. And then one of the two speakers today, uh, Dr. Downing or the guy right before me, uh, Willem, said spiritual warriors, uh, I'm going to go, this is like step, step, I'm going to go a big step here and say uh, none of us are spiritual warriors if, even if we think we are. What we really are is more than conquerors. Amen. Okay, do you know where it's written? It's Romans 8.28 through 39. Uh, the most important part, I believe, is 8.28 through 31. 8.30, Romans 8.28 31, no, 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 Romans 8, 31, it, it says this, uh, what then do we say in answer to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, your Cameron can't be against me, and my Sotero can't be against me, and that short guy with a bad attitude can't be against me, and my sister, who I haven't named, which is the glue between 9-11, G.H.W. Bush, oh, by the way, let's just straighten that out, G.H.W. Bush, uh, Four times, after he left office, four times he tried to assassinate his own son, G.W. Bush. Okay, something I learned here, Ian, so thanks for inviting me. I found out by talking to someone, let's say someone in this row, um, that, and I found this out two nights ago, I found out for the first time in my life, and I'm 66, but I'm still learning, that G.W. Bush apparently put out a hit on his father, G.H.W. Bush, in a Gulf Stream, probably a G3 out of Houston, which could be Houston Hobby, it could be Houston Intercontinental, it could be anything. Uh, but apparently GHWB got wind of this, so he let the airplane go. Oh, that's, that's really brave, isn't it? Okay, but he didn't go with it. 
okay? Well, anyway, the airplane went down and he didn't. He's still around. Now, do I hold any um, hatred towards G.H.W. Bush? No, I don't lower myself to hatred. I try to elevate myself to love. I love everybody in this room. I love the 7 billion people around the world. And anybody named G.H.W.B. or uh, Barry Swatero or John McCain or Hillary Clinton, uh, any of those people that want to kill random people just to show how powerful they are, I say, well, wait a minute, let's just slow down. Let's give it 48 hours and meet me at high noon, any street, any of the country. You know, I've been around the world. I've been in Muslim nations. Uh, I've spoken like this directly to Mus groups of Muslims. And uh, I've never had a Muslim try to kill me. I've never had a Brit try to kill me. I've never had an American try to kill me. The only res resistance I've ever had is from my own government. Well, they come and go, don't they? And look at yours. The thing that holds these governments together is pedophilia. So maybe just like uh, the previous speaker was talking about, maybe if we, not previous, that was last night, maybe if we take care of Palestine, we take care of the world. Yeah, maybe we do. I mean, I didn't... Now, I didn't ask to be born in Fort Worth, Texas in 1949. I just plopped out, okay? You guys didn't ask to be born. People in Kazakhstan, Rwanda, they didn't ask to be born there. Palestine's no different. Bosnia, uh, Serbia. I think I have, I know I have four daughters. I think one of them's engaged to a Serb, but it could be a Croatian. I'm not really good with geography. But, I, I, you know, some people would say, your daughter's going to marry somebody from another country? My answer is a quick one. Yeah, so am I. What's, wh who cares? Are we the same or are we different? You know, so it's a huge upgrade to me to go from an American model to a British model. Now, uh, and, and it, I'm not going to introduce her because she asked me not to. I'm also not going to introduce Agent Lima because he asked me not to introduce him. And if I told you why, and I will tell you, Ian, before I leave... It's really sort of humorous, but some people don't want to be known as having been here uh, because not everybody in our family under... My own sister, doesn't it? Oh, that brings up my own sister, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll give you her name before I leave. When you give me the two-minute warning, out comes her name. Uh, G.H.W. Bush, um, he's one of the targets of this. In fact, I wonder if his name's back here. No, it's not. Let's do something more positive than talk about the negative people. Let me give you from my own book, and I'm not trying to sell books, not at all. I'm trying to tell the truth and scare bad guys, and I'm, I'm doing both. Uh, I wish I... Preface, preface, preface. I don't remember a preface. Ah, acknowledgments. Let me read this briefly. There are numerous individuals without whom this book and this series would not be possible. None of them seek credit, so their real names will not be used, like Agent Lima. However, without the support of Agents Hawk, Barry M. Hall, and Tillman, this book would never have been written. If not for the encouragement of my fiancée, Denise, it would never have been considered. I just got tired of writing. Uh, but now I'm doing something different. Now I'm publishing, and I'm also speaking. And uh, after I'm gone, the words will still be here. And after I'm gone, the words will still be accurate. Having said that, if the perpetrators of these heinous crimes had not violated their oaths and killed innocent servants honoring their oaths, this truthful revelation would not be necessary and the fictional characters would not need to discover and expose. <coughs> Further, if it were not for God himself calling me to service, I dare not write this. Now, I just said expose, and watch this. They're going to get nervous. <laughs> I knew you would. On the back of this belt buckle, it says Ephesians 5.11. What that says is have nothing to do with the evil deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what I do in one sentence. And uh, does it cause me concern to do it? Not the least. I've been asked to do it. I will. Uh, if I die doing it, what's the point? Well, this t if I die speaking the truth, your sales are going right through the roof. Because <coughs> they'll want to say, what was the last guy that, what was the last thing he did? He went to Ian's. Uh, Hillary Clinton, somebody asked me, somebody in this room asked me to link her to 9-11. I've already done it. Uh, I gave the intellectual property of droning an aircraft to my sister. My sister, who has a lifestyle like Hillary, uh, and went to Georgetown University like Hillary, and works closely with Hillary, but my sister is higher than Hillary, and she's higher than... I didn't finish that off. Obama was given his U.S. passport by my sister in 1994. Uh, and I will give you my sister's name, but you're going to have to stay awake for it. Uh, the link to 9-11 is my sister. 
I've written books. Uh, Michael Shrimpton talked about a bunch of these aviation things. I've coined the term, which you can Google. If you Google my name plus Baker's Dozen, uh, those are the first 12 airline crashes that I rationalized or explained. Uh, but, uh, see, I don't play fair. And these people trying to kill you and me, they don't play fair either. So it's uh, like John Lennon's mind games. Okay, who's got the greater mind? Me or John McCain? It doesn't matter because I'm not using my mind and my information and my nerve. I'm using something much more powerful. The Baker's Dozen, see, I sort of played a mind game with them. I told them these 12 air airplanes have something. I never told them, actually, that there were four before that, the four 911 airplanes. It's all the same technology. It's all the same perpetrators. I've named uh, G.H.W. Bush. I'm going to name my sister. I've named Hillary. I've named McCain. All these names I bring up are perpetrators. Uh, when Michael Shrimpton talked, he talked about uh, some parts being found, parts of airplanes. Well, I'm not trying to steal his thunder. And he, I mean, we're on the same team. That's why I stood up to defend him earlier today. Uh, and being on the same team, the only thing we need to have in common is the truth and the willingness to speak it. But uh, I'm trying to remember the date. It's June 25th of 2014. I was writing some fiction, and everything I'm telling you, anyone that wants to come up to me and say, can you prove that? Well, I'll tell you right now. Yeah, I can. But if you want me to prove this, what I'm going to tell you next, I, I said, because I was really trying to intimidate the Australians, because they're such poor liars. I said, what they're going to do, I put this in writing on June 25th, 2014. You can expect Warren Truss and Angus Houston, the two searchers, not the real searchers, that was a rock group. These guys are the searchers from Malaysia 370, which said that if we don't get it done in the next 60 days, say by September of 2016, we'll give up the search. Well, you should have given up the search about the 8th of March of 2014, but just sort of to play with them. And this is John Lennon, mind games. Yeah, I said, well, what these Australians are gonna do next is they're gonna take an airplane they're going to fly over here, and they're going to drop some Easter eggs out. Then they're going to fly over here, and they're going to drop some Easter eggs out. And then they're going to fly over here and drop some Easter eggs. And then they're going to go back to Australia and probably have mineral water with a lime slice since they don't have the nerve to have beer. And then they're going to sit and say, okay, our guys will find what we've laid. It's like an Easter egg hunt. We put the eggs out. Now it's morning, so all the kids will run out and find the Easter eggs, and then we won't have a problem with the Chinese, the Americans, the Dutch, the Vietnamese, the Singapore because we will have solved the problem. Rongo, you created the problem, I'll solve the problem. Uh, th we got the Easter eggs June 29th, yep, that's right. I said 25th earlier, didn't I? I think it was the 25th. Uh, have I ever predicted anything else? Yes, you heard me say that I predicted not Malaysia 17, but the 17th of July, which is when Malaysia 17 went down. One more thing I predicted, and I'll be brutally honest, I was making this up. But I had a reason to make it up, and at 3.35 p.m. on Monday, the 8th of November, I sent a letter to numerous elements of the U.S. government, not that I have any faith in them, because I don't. Uh, I said, you're going to have an aviation false flag this week, and it's going to occur between right now, 15.35 on the 8th of November, and 23.11. Okay, why did I say 23.11? Anybody heard of the Masons? They love certain numbers. So, yeah, let's just go ahead and match wits. I said 2311 on the 11th of November. Why did I say the 11th of November? Because it was the same week, and it's my parents' anniversary, and it's Veterans Day. A lot of these dead veterans, they can't stand up and fight, and they can't take on their governments. Uh, do I want to be doing this? No. I'd rather be slow dancing, just me and my baby. Um, that's a song by Johnny Rivers. I'd rather be fishing. I'd rather be walking around these beautiful grounds, but that's not what I was designed for, so I'll just keep doing what I'm supposed to do, and that's to tell the truth and also to encourage people that uh, the good side will win this, no matter how grim it has looked for a number of years. Uh, I, since I got here, once again, I want to tip my hat to uh, Ian. By June 2nd, there's going to be a landslide legal case announced it's going to involve the biggest frauds that have ever fallen on UK soil. And, and uh, the, tr the number of the legal case is 40GM slash 54894 slash 15. And uh, it'll be known uh, generically as a landmark case. Uh, what's it involved? 788 to 790 Finchley Road. Anybody heard of that address? 
well, guess what? I'm not anti-English. I'm marrying one of you. But uh, we, have our, we have our Finchley Road, too, and it's called uh, North Orange Street in some place in Delaware where all of our corporations are registered. Our corporations are what's killing America, uh, and they're doing it for the benefit of some people like the Crown Agents, the Vatican, the central banks, and a bunch of cowards. And that's what they all are. They're a bunch of cowards. And I, if any of you are central bankers or crown agents or Vatican popes and you want to join me here and we can match wits for like maybe three and a half seconds, uh, you're welcome to do so. I'm looking for any other notes I might have, but any, if you want me to be quiet, just say so. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, I, I sometimes predict things, and sometimes because of the group I work with, Able Danger, we stop things. I got so sick of Lindsey Graham and John McCain saying, we've got to attack Syria, and this is rather colorful, but I'll keep it even so ladies that are 28 and go to church aren't going to be offended. Uh, I put out a Google pairing in August of 2013 because I didn't want to see a bunch of Syrians get killed just for John McCain, and I said... Uh, well, I said a lot of things. I write a lot. And, but if you want to find out what I said then, Google Putin, P-U-T-I-N, Assad, A-S-S-A-D. Here comes the colorful part. CRISP, C-R-I-S-P, foreplay, F-O-U-R-P-L-A-Y, uh, McCain in Syria. And you can see what I wrote back then. And uh, there, were plans, there, there were plans with the U.S. military to go into Syria and start killing innocent people. Uh, Somebody caused those plans to be canceled. Okay, on the 9-11, there were four flights. Three of them hit their target. Which one didn't hit their target? United 93. Somebody caused United 93 to have a 41-minute delay, and by the time it would have gotten to the U.S. Capitol, John Kerry, remember I was talking about cowards? Uh, John Kerry ran out of the building so fast that he knocked a lady over on the Capitol steps and was he a gentleman? Did he turn around and say, forgive me, let me help you to your feet? No, he kept running. He might have a $500 haircut, but he doesn't have much underneath it, and he has no heart. Uh, do do I wanted to put a YouTube up for one minute to sort of establish how I got drawn into this.
sometimes people believe what I have to say about the flying events of 9-11. And I'm sure that, uh, well, I'm sure I'm going to die. And I'm sure I'm happy with that. I'm also equally sure that until November 10th of last year, I was a lot more willing to die than I was after I met um, Denise. And she and I decided, well, maybe since we're both on the same team, what does that mean? Uh, Michael Shrimpton and I are on the same team. Ian, you're on the same team. Guitar player, you're on the same team. We're all on the same team, so why don't we just relax and let whoever's turn it is to shoot the ball, shoot the ball. But uh, we, we will win this. And uh, when uh, Denise entered my life, I did, see, I've been doing stuff that's dangerous anyway with reckless abandon. I'm still recklessly abandoned personality, but I do have something or someone to live for, and she doesn't want to be introduced, but I'll be with two blonde women when I stand down from here, which reminds me, stand down in the military. That's, what, that's how they attacked America on 9-11. They stood down the military. What a bunch of cowards. And let me name those names. The, the Canadian cowards, uh, Major General Maurice Burrill, and then I'll get the American coward, whose name, in case I die, it's Henry Shelton uh, and Ralph Eberhardt. But the five Canadians that attacked America on 9-11, let me repeat that. The five Canadians that attacked America on 9-11, Major General Maurice Burrill, Captain Rick Finley, Lieutenant General Charles Bouchard, uh, General of some sort, Angus Watt, and Colonel Russell Williams. Does anybody in this room, have they ever heard the name Colonel Russell Williams? I heard one yes. He's the guy who was the rising star of the Canadian military. He used to fly your queen when she was in Canada. He was accused and proven guilty of 18, 82 fetish break-ins. What's a fetish break-in? That's when a guy like me, mean, simply meaning my height, my color, my hair, uh, my continent, when you go into ladies' bedrooms by breaking into their house and steal some of their private clothing, and then you do it 80 time, 82 times, and you stash it in your uh, attic of your garage, hoping your wife never finds it. That's called a fetish break-in. Uh, that's not a big deal. It is to me, because one of his victims was a 13-year-old girl, and he, her laptop was on, and he left her a message. Uh, yeah, I know. These, it's evil. It's not, it's not corrupt. It's not criminal. It's not national. It's not race-based. It's not age-based. It's not faith-based. It's evil. I, I, did I have a comment to answer? Satanic. It's a what? Satanic. Oh, I'm glad you said that, because if you cover up the D, you get evil. Okay, and I said that the pedophilia is what glues this together. It's also Satan worship, and where does that start? Uh, Satan worship starts right in the Vatican. Does that mean all Vaticans or Catholics are bad? I mean, Vatican servants. No. There's a bad team, but see, just like our government, uh, there's probably one or four... American government entities that are good, but even those four aren't doing their job. They're not. And if anybody in the United States government wants to meet me at an uh, Ian R. Crane speaking event, say in Dallas or Minneapolis or Vancouver, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Or if you want to meet again here with UK Column or Richie Allen or Ian, I, I will meet anybody in our U.S. government. I'll give them advantage. I'll ten of them, one of me, and then ten of them. He had a question, and it was a good question. Now, I'd like to take all the questions I could, but unfortunately, not all questions, no offense, but not all questions are good. Not all questions uh, do I know the answer to, and I see you're all getting warm. Uh, in fact, that's sort of like when I name these names of who did it, I'm getting warm too, and now I'm getting really hot. George H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, 9-11, Hillary Clinton, 9-11, John McCain, 9-11, those five Canadians. Uh, the guy that I said, Russell Williams, um, 
He's in prison because in addition to stealing personal items belonging to females, and I, I, I'm sort of heterosexual. I like females, but more than that, I respect them. Let them put their stuff wherever they want and leave it alone. That's, that's not what you do. You leave it alone. Okay, did, is that all he did? Nope. He also, I don't like the word R-A-P-E-D, so I won't even say it. It's repugnant to me, and I can't spell repugnant. He R-A-P-E-D'd four women. God bless all of them, but especially the one who had the presence of mind to pull his mask off. And so I just made eye contact with a woman, and I don't, I'm breaking it. I'm going to make eye contact with Ian. Okay, Ian, so you and I are face-to-face, -face and you pull my mask off. Okay, now you know who I am. This woman knew who he was. He's Colonel Russell Williams from the Canadian Air Force. She was a flight attendant on his airplane. And, and once that cowardly bastard named Russell Williams realized she had seen him, he murdered her. Okay, and he murdered a woman named Jessica Lang. Oh, uh, that's not right. Jessica Lloyd. Uh, this is how little he understood about physics and females. He raped... I hate that word. Slipped. He did that, then he put her in a freezer, and then he waited till the middle of the night several days later. And by the way, the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police, they were all over this. They knew what he was doing. They knew who he did it to, and they did nothing. That's not good enough in Rwanda, in Kazakhstan, in the UK, in Canada, or in my neighborhood. Now, in my neighborhood, we do not have police officers, and we do not need them. Okay, here's where he didn't understand women very well, and by the way, it doesn't matter, but, uh, well, no, I'll leave it at that. It just doesn't matter. But when he hung her in a tree, thinking that if he hung her by her ankles that there'd be no DNA evidence, uh, Russell, note to Russell, if you're going to hang another woman who's dead and you don't want the DNA, uh, anyway, he, he didn't know anything. If he did, he wouldn't kill another human. But I've named enough names uh, I can name a lot more names, but I think I'm out of time, aren't I? So let me say thank you very much. It's my blessing to be here, and I can't believe your, couraging, your courage for allowing me to come speak. Okay. So thank you. My sister's name is Christine with a K, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Marcy, M-A-R-C-Y. She invented... Uh, because Jimmy Carter asked her to in 1978, he said, Christine, would you start the United States Senior Executive Service? In 1979, she created the United States Executive Senior Executive Service. She participated in Branch Davidian. She participated in the Murrah Building. She participates in all the false flags. And is she my only sibling? Yes. Would I pull the trap on the gallows? Yes. A thousand times over, yes. You don't kill anybody and think, I'm going to like you because you're my sister. I rest my case. You know, I really look forward to attending a talk with Phil McConnell where he doesn't hold back and he tells us what he really thinks. Build, <laughs> you, never, you never fail. And uh, long may you continue to speak truth to power. So thanks very much for coming over the Atlantic and sharing this weekend with us. Thank you very much. And Thank you.